Good morning, and welcome to East Rose Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. I'm Jan Applin Curtis, your worship leader today, and we're happy you have chosen to join us in online worship. If you are visiting for the first time today, a special welcome. We are glad you sought us out and hope you return again in the future. If you have joys or concerns or announcements that you'd like to share, you can do so by writing them in the chat space on YouTube. They will be shared at the appropriate point in the service. Joys and Concerns is earlier in the service than what many of us are used to, so please add yours in the chat soon or by story time today. For future reference, you also have the option to email a joy, concern, or announcement to worship at eastrose.org no later than Saturday, the day before the service. After the conclusion of each service, there will be a Zoom cafe conversation time for all of us to visit. Just exit YouTube and log in to the Zoom link provided on our website. Our congregation honors those who first lived on the land where our church stands. Traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalupia, Molala, and many other tribes and bands. Our speaker today is our own Reverend Patty Pomerantz. Her topic, the Transcendentalists, who they were, how they related to Unitarian Universalism, and what they have to teach us today. Our opening words, we gather in community to rest from our labors, to greet our neighbors, and to open our being to insight and intuition of that greater reality of which we are a part. May we find time together, inspiration and renewal. May we touch the holy in each other and be touched by the graciousness of life. May we find here a calm peacefulness that will carry us through the days ahead. Amen. Jello sliding. This fire is a reminder of the light within us all, the yearning for freedom, 
the longing for truth, the flame of intuition, the torch of consciousness, we dedicate this service to the remembrance of the holy light. I don't know how many children we have watching, but if we do, there are riddles in this story for you to solve. Imagine yourself about 10 years old with your father. And your father says, what do you want for your birthday? Do you want a doll? She wrinkled her nose and scrunched her eyes and thought, no, a tea set, a pony? No, father, I have a year to think. I want this year to be a special year to remember. Ellen thought. She thought of bonbons, chocolate, dresses, hats, boots, books, gloves, lace collars, but none of these were what she wanted. What would be special? Each day, her father asked her, Ellen, do you know what you want for your birthday yet? And Ellen would shake her head, no, father, I'm still thinking. After four days, her father said, Ellen, Yes, father, she said, I've decided. Well, he asked, I have a riddle. It will tell you what gift I want for my birthday. The riddle is this, you cannot buy it for it is worth all the money you have, but only you can give it. Her father said, hmm, I need to repeat this riddle because it will tell me what gift you want for your birthday. I cannot buy it because it is worth all the money I have, but only I can give it. Is that right? Yes, father. Well, now it is my turn to think about your riddle. I have to find the perfect present in this mystery. Her father paced and pondered. He repeated the riddle over and over. I cannot buy it, but only I can give it. Finally, he smiled. I know what it is. I know what it is. Now, he had to think about how to give it. When Ellen's birthday came, there was no present from her father. 
She didn't expect one. After she opened the presents from her brother and sister, from her mother and grandmother, and after the cake was all gone and the celebration over, Ellen's father said, it is now time for Ellen's present from me. Ellen, come and sit with me. So Ellen climbed into the armchair and sat on her father's lap. My present to you is very special. I hope it is what you wanted, for it is not a book or a toy or clothes, but instead it is a present that is for all seasons and for each day. This year, your birthday present from me is that we will spend time together every week, just the two of us, for you are my very special daughter and I love you dearly. Ellen hugged him. Oh, Father, I knew you would figure out the riddle. Her father said, you cannot buy it, for it is worth all the money you have, but only you can give it. It took me a long time to figure out the answer, but when I did, I knew what gift you wanted. The answer was simple. Give yourself. Oh, Father, I wanted a gift to make this year special. Time together with you will make this year the very best of my life. Ellen looked at her father's eyes. Why, father, you are crying. Yes, you teach me more than any book I've ever read or written. By giving you time, I will gain more than I give. It was Ellen's turn to figure out the riddle. How could her father, by spending time with her, get more than he gave? She thought she knew, love multiplies. But perhaps she would only understand when she was older, when she had children of her own. But her father understood, and when he wrote an essay on giving, he wrote, give yourself, for he knew the wonder of this gift. And her father was, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote of the great mysteries of transcendentalism. Through all the 
We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. May we give in love and in hope. Half of this week's offering supports Snowcap Community Charities, which provides food, clothing, advocacy, and other services to low-income people in East Multnomah County. You can donate using your phone to scan the code shown on the screen, and you'll be sent to the East Rose website donation page. Or you may choose to donate after the service by visiting our website and clicking the donate button. The gifts of the congregation will now be most gratefully received. The Oversoul by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Let us learn the revelation of all nature and thought, that the highest dwells within us, that the sources of nature are in our minds. As there is no screen or ceiling between our hands and the infinite heavens, so there is no bar or wall in the soul where we, the effect, cease, and God, the cause, begins. I am constrained every moment to acknowledge a higher origin for events than the will I call mine. There is a deep power in which we exist and whose beautitude is accessible to us. Every moment when the individual feels invaded by it is memorable. It comes to the lowly and simple. It comes to whosoever will put off what is foreign and proud. It comes as insight. It comes as serenity and grandeur. The soul's health consists in the fullness of its reception. Forever and ever, the influx of this better and more universal self is new and unsearchable. Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affectations, it is love. The definition of transcendentalism from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy reads, transcendentalism is an American literary philosophical, religious, and political movement of the early 19th century centered around Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's at least four sermons, and I'm not gonna do that to you or me. This reflection centers on a new book 
by John Buren's former president of the Unitarian Universalist Association called Conflagration, how the transcendentalists sparked the American struggle for ra racial, gender, and social justice. When I started reading it, I thought, oh my, this is dense. So many little details about different relationships. By the end, I thought, this is reading like a soap opera. Because what it's really about is a small group of people and their relationships to one another. It's an example of the saying, there is no history, only biography, which has always spoken to me as I do not do very well studying history, but bi biography I can handle. <clears throat> there are also several locations in the Boston area that are considered central to transcendentalism. You're familiar with Walden Pond, but there's also Brook Farm, an experiment in communal living, and the homes of William Ellery Channing, which was across the Boston Common from the home and bookstore of Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, where, for instance, Margaret Fuller had many of her conversations for women, which I'll talk about later, which was the beginning of our struggle for gender equality in this country. And it was those two families, Channing and Peabody, who supported James Freeman Clark's Church of the Disciples, a more egalitarian and activist Boston church. It's hard to separate the transcendentalists from the Unitarians. Not all Unitarians in the late 18th and 19th centuries were transcendentalists but most transcendentalists were Unitarian. As Buren says, transcendentalism was a movement almost entirely within the congregational churches of the Boston area that had become Unitarian. Now the word Unitarian was coined as a slur by Orthodox Christians. It was William Channing who decided to claim it in his sermon Unitarian Christianity, which he delivered at an ordination of Jared Sparks in Baltimore in 1819. One of the first points he makes in this sermon is that the Bible is a book written for men in the language of men, and that its meaning is to be sought in the same manner as that of other books. The Bible expects us to restrain and modify its language by the known truths which observation and experience furnish of these topics. Now think back to what you know about the early Unitarians. They came out of the Puritan tradition in New England. The Puritans bought the, built the towns of early New England, and they were looking for religious freedom to practice conservative Calvinism, also called Reformed tradition, Reformed religion, and Reformed Protestant, coming out of the Reformation. Now, John Calvin is one of the theologians who was responsible for spreading certain beliefs of the Re Reformation. Martin Luther published 95 theses, which he posted on the door of his church in 1513, the start of the Reformation. He believed in the sovereignty of God and the absolute authority of the Bible. He also believed in predestination, which held that people were predestined to heaven or hell regardless of what they did in their lives. Salvation by faith, not by deed. These were the very things that early Unitarians were opposed to, the sovereignty of God, absolute authority of the Bible, and predestination or salvation by faith, not by deed. <clears throat> Unitarianism grew into a faith for the intellectual and privileged, focused on how to improve themselves and not always aware of social ills. 
but there were Unitarians who were concerned about conditions in society. They also believed that one's relationship to God was individual. This was a break from traditional Unitarianism that still saw the church as the way to God. If you remember my last sermon on religion, I spoke about Theodore Parker and his address, The Transient and Permanent in Christianity. He was on his way to becoming a transcendentalist and reformer, believing there was no intermediary between an individual and their relationship with God. This is the same thing that Ralph Waldo Emerson was saying to his daughter. After that sermon, many felt he should leave the Unitarian movement for his beliefs. Others, especially those who believed as he did, were happy to have him as a way to stay within the circle of Unitarianism. Still, while transcendentalism is primarily seen as a literary movement, think Henry David Thoreau and Margaret Fuller, in fact, many of the early transcendentalists were also Unitarian ministers. William Mallory Channing, Ralph Waldo Emerson, James Freeman Clark, and their families. What I've seen through the eyes of this book is that the intricacies of the relationship between abolition, women's rights, and the religion we have inherited is mirrored in the intricacies among a few families who intermarried and commingled in other ways. Today, I will focus on two individuals whose lives intertwined. Their journals and letters show us much of how transcendentalism both grew and how it became concerned about matters of justice. One is James Freeman Clark, and the other is Margaret Fuller. Now, Clark was raised in part by his grandfather, a Unitarian minister, who let James decide what he was interested to study and gave the boy access to his library. This may explain why he left to study at, Hartford, at Harvard when he was 15, although that was not unusual at that time. There, he met Margaret Fuller. Now, here's some of the relationship intermingling. Her courtship by George Davis, a friend and classmate of Clark's, epitomized who she was to become. Apparently, when deciding marriage back then, the last thing the suitor asked about was religious beliefs to make sure there would be no embarrassment to the groom's family. When Davis asked Margaret, she refused to compromise her views, replying, she was singularly barren of illusions in matters of faith and unwilling to have her deepest feelings soothed by any doctrine. Davis never responded. Now, Clark was also frustrated in his relationship to Elizabeth Randall, a friend of Margaret's. James had a quarrel with Elizabeth and then promptly apologized in a note to her. She never responded. Asking Margaret's advice, Margaret neglected to tell him that Elizabeth never responded because Margaret intercepted the letter. Fuller believed that Elizabeth wasn't worthy of Clark and that Clark wasn't ready for marriage. When the truth came out sometime later, Clark agreed with Margaret's reasoning. Imagine if that were to happen today. Now, James loved the country, which is why he spent so much time on his grandfather's farm. He credits this with his love of nature, which inspired much of transcendentalism, as his grandfather based his tutoring on James' own interests. Now, James, the grandfather, was the minister of King's Chapel, an important Unitarian church in Boston still today. Before he retired, he helped to start the American Unitarian Association, the precursor of the Unitarian Universalist Association. 
After college, Clark needed to settle on a career. Because he admired his grandfather, he decided on ministry. It was Margaret, among others, who encouraged him. When he was ready for his own church, rather than taking one in the Boston area, which he did not feel prepared for, he decided to evangelize in the West and took a pulpit in Louisville. He went on be being actively engaged in the new Unitarian churches in the West, and then he also ran the Disciples Church in Boston, and he became a very early proponent of comparative religion. Fuller, meanwhile, was the first woman to attend the Transcendentalist Circle that was hosted by Emerson, and a second hosted by her friend Clark. She too had to earn a living. And with encouragement from both men, she hosted a set of lectures called Conversations with Women, for which she charged $20, and which was attended by about 12 women. Among other things, she spoke about, quote, and remember this is in 1840, gender polarity and subordination assumed in Puritan culture. Among the attendees, most of whom were of considerable privilege, considering they had to pay $20 back then, was Lydia Maria Francis Child, who Buren says is the most neglected female transcendentalist of her time, another sermon. She and Fuller later moved to New York, where they were both writers and spiritual friends. Now, spiritual friendships were important to transcendentalists, both because they often differed theologically and because their individual journeys were so isolated. They still exist today in Quaker circles. But imagine for a minute if you had one other member of East Rose as a spiritual friend, hopefully someone whose theology is different from your own, and that you got together solely for the purpose of deeply listening to each other's beliefs. This is one thing that happened in transcendentalism in the mid-19th century, partly to facilitate their goals of both abolition and women's rights. Here's what Buren says about James Freeman Clark's and Margaret Fuller's spiritual friendship. Clark, close to Fuller since their young adulthood, exemplifies the transcendentalist commitment to the practice of spiritual friendship, often transcending differences in gender, class, opinion, and particularly radical for the time, race. That ideal stemmed from the conviction that only by helping others realize their moral, spiritual, and creative potential can one fulfill one's own. And only through mutual concern can just communities begin to emerge. Clark edited the first transcendentalist journal, The Western Messenger. Fuller, also a journalist, um, Clark published some of her early essays in his journal. But she became a journalist in her own right, editing The Dial, another transcendentalist journal. And she also wrote for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune as an investigative reporter, and a few years later became the first American foreign correspondent covering the 1848 revolutions in Europe. As she edited the dial from 1840 to 1844, and men failed to submit promised pieces, she filled an issue with her own essay, The Great Lawsuit, Man versus Men, Woman versus Women. In it, she, quote, argued for a future in which inward and outward freedom for women as much as for man shall be acknowledged as a right not yielded as a concession. As the friend of the Negro assumes that one man cannot by right hold another in bondage, so should the friend of women 
assume that man cannot, by right, lay even well-meant restrictions on women. If the Negro be a soul, if the woman be a soul, apparelled in flesh, to one master only are they accountable." End quote. Now she went to Rome to escape for a time some of the negative responses to her writing. There she met a young revolutionary and had a child. And to this day, no one knows if they married because when, the 18, when in 1849, the Roman Republic failed, the three, husband, wife, and child, sailed to America, only to fall victim to their ship's wreck near Fire, near Fire Island. And most of their belongings were destroyed. Boston was also an important part of the Underground Railroad. It had both proponents and opponents among Unitarians. Boston also had a well-established free black community. It was the transcendentalists, both black and white, who promoted both abolition and what they called higher law, which we might call civil disobedience, when what we believe to be moral is contradicted by actual law, like the Fugitive Slave Act. Clark met John Brown while visiting a neighbor and parishioner who had been beat up on the Senate floor following a speech against the expansion and sexual exploitation of slavery. Clark also met Frederick Douglass and the first black attorney in Boston, Robert Morris. Clark and Theodore Parker had an unlikely compassion, companionship, a spiritual friendship, as they were theologically very different. Clark was a Unitarian Christian, while Parker was considered an infidel in Unitarian circles. He found an absolute religion at the core of all faith traditions, asking only that we love God or the ground of our shared ex existence and our neighbors as ourselves and helped to inspire Clark to use a period of recuperation from a serious illness to study non-Christian traditions. Clark went on to teach ethnic religions, taught the first courses in comparative religions at Harvard, and published a two-volume study, 10 Great Religions, that went through 22 editions. With their openness to religious pure pluralism, the Transcendentalists then helped to pave the way for greater interfaith dialogue and cooperation in matters of justice. Clark worked with his old friend, Henry Whitney Bellows, to send Thomas Starr King to California, <clears throat> where he helped Bellows to develop the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Meanwhile, Clark wanted to unite Unitarians as the core of a new liberal church of America. But after his death, the Unitarian Christians and the more radical free religious association couldn't find a way to stay together. In comparison with Fuller's death at sea, Clark died in 1888, surrounded by his family and so peacefully, they scarcely knew when he breathed his last breath. Now, I have only barely touched the surface of the stories of these two great transcendentalists and how they influenced one another in so many aspects of their lives. But I hope you've gotten a flavor for the movement and especially how it informs our sense of justice work. In some ways, we haven't come all that very far since. And I will uh, come to the Zoom cafe after the service for anyone who wants to get more information or ask me questions. And now I invite you to join in our closing hymn, Light of Ages and of Nations.
We have basked in the warmth and beauty of this flame and this community. As the chalice flame is extinguished, let us carry its glow within. Let us kindle new sparks within these walls and beyond. As we come to the end of our service today, let us remember that as we have family ancestors, we also have religious ancestors to whom we owe many of the freedoms we enjoy today. Let us be thankful to those known and unknown who have given us life, curious minds, and the will to keep searching. Amen. Announcements. <clears throat> we have good news. The church building will be open for in-person services beginning next week on the 13th. We were closed briefly due to the surge in COVID. See the website or pedals for safety protocols that we continue to follow uh, for those visiting in person, including uh, the requirement of wearing um, good quality masks, and being fully vaccinated. Next week, our speaker will be the Reverend Sue Matranga Watson, and her reflection is titled, titled, What's Love Got to Do With It? There will also be some special music provided. We have um, an announcement about the chalice lighters. The winter call for the 21-22 church year is winding down, and um, we've already been awarded $15,000 for a hybrid church services project, and we're eligible for more to further enhance our budget. Winter calls are, will be accepted through February 28th, so that's coming up, so please don't delay. Your contribution as a chalice lighter donor will directly benefit East Rose during this call. There are several ways to do this. It can be a one-time gift as low as $20 or $50 or $100 online, or you can mail your check. For more information, see, see the pedals and call the office if you have any questions. Before we conclude today's service, I'd like to thank those that were involved today. Reverend Patty, thank you. Mary Rees, beautiful music and visuals to go along with the music. And our wonderful AV 
tech team in the back here, Phyllis Adams and John Netherton. Thank you all. So um, this concludes today's service and you're invited to join us at the Zoom Cafe Conversations. Sherry will put the link in the chat or you can also check your, the website or the pedals for the link to join. Thanks everybody.